Making qualitative research data openly available is not always straightforward, especially when working with vulnerable groups of study participants. There appears to be a conflict between the intent of sharing data openly and protecting the interests of the participants of a study. We will now talk to two researchers who will tell us about how they approach this dilemma. Professor Ann Teresa Lotterington and postdoc Lili Mitna. You work on a project called the Artful Dementia Research Lab. Tell us about your research. Yes, thank you. Uh, the Artful Dementia Research Lab has, uh, over the last four years, grow grown into a research community in which we uh, do um, uh, art interventions with people with dementia. So the keywords are art, dementia and research. And our intention is to produce new knowledge about life with dementia and use this knowledge to uh, fight uh, stigma and shame, which is very often uh, related to people living with dementia. And I would add that uh, the research approach we uh, have applied is fundamentally uh, um, ethical. And uh, that means that um, we, uh, before we do any action, we reflect very thoroughly in the lab about what we do and why we do it and uh, make sure that uh, we are ethical. And uh, uh, when we are in the field, we not only observe for our own analytical purpose, but also to make sure that the uh, people uh, who participate uh, fare well. So this is our way to secure that um, the people uh, involved uh, thrive and uh, that they uh, do not suffer when taking part. And uh, by doing this, we um, hopefully can make a standard for how to relate to people with, de with dementia in research. What is your motivation to openly share research data from this project? Um, the arts are not simply a means to uh, disseminate data, but they are in our methodological approach to collect and analyze data. So our results will mainly benefit society, hopefully, and in this way it's a kind of citizen science project in which uh, we would like to give insight into our work to the broader community. And of course we want to get give insight uh, into the process to other researchers that um, possibly can build on our experience and further use our data uh, we collect and to drive the research field in other dementia forward. Yeah and for me I would say I'd, that uh, it's very important for us to let others scrutinize our research so that's why we're opening, uh, opening up. And uh, the reason for that is that it's almost impossible to apply standard uh, validity and reliability tests to our research because um, uh, because of the, the qualitative nature uh, of the research data uh, and uh, I would say that an additional motivation for opening the research process is that uh, we do not only visualize or make visible the participants but also the researchers and this is the scary part about uh, this research because uh, when we open up and, and people can see us as well, then um, uh, we also become vulnerable. But that adds to our ethical approach that uh, makes the research process more equal between the participants and, and the researchers. So, but as we or you already mentioned, is that um, it's not straightforward when working with people with uh, uh, dementia who are considered vulnerable people. Hmm. Uh, can you tell us more about the data you collect? Yeah, during a co-creative session uh, uh, we produce a variety of uh, different uh, qualitative and arts-based data. We are catching what we call for resonating moments and those moments are somehow our data units which we would like to analyze and uh, make sense of and yeah, further explore. And uh, we could describe those moments in which people connect uh, by words only, but then uh, we would lose a lot of uh, sensory information. So um, uh, 
the data we collect, um, we have to recall in our collective analysis uh, sessions and yeah, to build our arguments. And the combination then of qualitative data and the arts and arts-based data is essential for us to conducting aesthetic analysis of resonating moments. This sounds fascinating. Um, what is the format of the data that you intend to share? Yeah, so we yeah we gather traditional qualitative data. So it's uh, um, pictures and videos and sound recordings and uh, written field notes and logbooks. But also um, we collect what we call for arts-based uh, data that can be drawings or, or scribes or uh, yeah, small pieces of music and dances. And those uh, might have the similar materiality. They are like <laughs> yeah, recorded or, or yeah, in, in a, its picture, but um, they have to be handled differently. So uh, in terms of copyright, for example, but also as part of um, a larger sensory knowledge. That's uh, a lot of different types of data. But what is it that needs protection in your data? Why do you need to be cautious when sharing them? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, it's, uh, even though we neither collect um, uh, health information or other sensitive information, we do work with people, as we mentioned, um, vulnerable people. And uh, they um, should be protected. That, and that's standard within research to do. Uh, but um, uh, very important in this context is that we have the video and uh, audio uh, recordings. Uh, and by definition, they are considered uh, personal information because you can recognize people uh, there. So therefore, we have to comply with the data protection legislation. Um, well, in, um, in quantitative research and also in some types of um, qualitative studies, uh, the data can be anonymized so that the GDPR uh, no longer applies to the data. Why is that not an option for you? Uh, first, I must say that we actually do anonymize uh, our data if it's appropriate. Uh, we do, for example, use uh, pictures uh, names all along from writing logs to writing uh, uh, our, to our publications. But then again, the audiovisual material is another case, and it's, then it's not feasible to do it. And that's because uh, when we analyze that da the data, we direct our attention to what happens in groups and how relations develop. So to grasp what happens, we need to see uh, facial expressions and uh, bodily motion and touch. And to, to and that means that to document what we could have done differently was to just document hands or backs or to to blur faces, but that wouldn't make sense. Then we wouldn't see and we wouldn't be able to document exactly what we would like to to document. And uh, it's also uh, an important point here that uh, we work with people who often might have um, lost their language, that they are not able to speak in ways that we normally speak to people. So they uh, should be able to express themselves uh, differently. So they talk with other means, and that's what we seek to document. Uh, um, and uh, when opening up the research for others to see what we have seen, uh, we make it possible for the, uh, to, I mean, to, to show them the, the, the motions and, and, and emotions <laughs> and so on that we have seen. Then others also can understand what we have seen and, and scrutinize, as I mentioned earlier, um, the results uh, and analyze our analysis. So, um, um, yeah, so we, we then in the, in the process. Uh, of the analysis, we and and by showing this, we we show to others uh, what made sense to us and how we came to the conclusions that we came to. So this is an, an important part of the scrutinizing, of others scrutinizing of our research. I see. It is impossible for you to anonymize the data without losing the information, which is important. And this is probably something that. Um, researchers working with um, transcriptions and even quantitative data also can relate to. Um, anonymization tends to reduce the information in the data and therefore can affect the usability of the data and uh, even the accuracy of the results. 
But tell us about how you're able to share this data legally. Yeah, we are able to share the data uh, by a combination of informed consent and by depositing in archives with a restricted access. Uh, and when we are collaborating with people with dementia, of course, we, we uh, face a lot of ethical dilemmas because they become both co-researchers and uh, co-creators of art. Uh, and the current ethical guidelines for collaborating with people living with dementia are based mostly on biomedical or clinical um, frameworks. And according to these frameworks, uh, informed consent requires understanding of complex written documents. And as a result, many people uh, with cognitive difficulties, such as, for example, those living with dementia, they are excluded from participating in uh, creative and arts-based projects. And therefore, it's a very hard of our project to explore to what extent ethics and ethical guidelines might be extended with reference to uh, artistic values. Uh, can you talk about m a bit more about this? Can you take us through the process? Yeah, so generally we are gathering uh, consent uh, through three different pathways throughout the project. So first, before the project starts, we obtain uh, legal consent through those written consent forms and this is provided either by the person living with dementia or their legal uh, representative uh, as a con yeah, consent by proxy. And um, we make sure that this uh, consent is granular and specific so we use several uh, check boxes uh, so that it's clear that they consent not only to the participate participation but also to open publishing of uh, video material that they have to approve in advance and also to uh, archiving for the purpose of uh, future research. And the second, uh, then the second form of consent is obtained continuously uh, during the data collection, so during those sessions. Um, and uh, we use art and creative methods to obtain a form of consent that we conceptualize as aesthetic consent. And it's a form of relational consent, uh, which is necessary that um, mm, as a, for which it is necessary that the researcher is involved in the relation that are studies. So how can I know that an interaction, uh, uh, um, yeah, how could I know that a person agrees to become involved in a specific interaction uh, without being part of it by myself? So I have to be part of this uh, uh, interaction to be able to study it in, yeah, uh, ethical, uh, um, uh, yeah, that it's uh, ethically correct to study it. And this processual consent comes in addition to the documented and the legal consent. And third, at the end of the project, we uh, ask uh, for consent by editing. And this is to approve parts of the material to be shared either with the restricted access or for other, as for other researchers or with the broader community as an openly published video, for example, or a photo or writing or story. Hmm. Sounds comprehensive. With all these steps, it must be important to plan everything from an early time. Yes, it's very crucial, the planning. And um, already before the project starts, we must know, um, have a very cl clear idea of what kind of data we're going to collect and what we're going to do with it, uh, where we intend to deposit it or, or archive it, and what should be deleted after the end of the project. And we can never know fully in advance, of course, what's going to happen, but uh, uh, we create a scenario of what might be possible. And uh, we started to make a tabular overview uh, of all the different types of uh, different materials we are collecting during the process. And it's a table that gives us an overview of uh, where it will be stored and who will have access throughout the pro process. Mm. Okay. so. You intend to deposit the bulk of the raw data in an archive with controlled access. How is that access going to be managed? Well, um, the metadata will be openly available and also be searchable. Um, and uh, we will also refer to data sets uh, in our publications. So this way it will be findable. But um, um, if there are researchers who would like to have access to this uh, data, they have to uh, apply and they have to also to um, uh, register and uh, uh, before to the <laughs> to the the, um, uh, the curators of the research data, uh, and they the, the curators they will check uh, that um, the new research follows them 
data sets, um, the terms of the data sets, including the consent given by, by the participants. Hmm. According to the GDPR, the participants have the right to have the information deleted. How does that affect your work? Mm. Yeah, of course, we need to uh, comply with that right and if that should happen. So we are filming a group collectively and if one person withdraw, then uh, this would uh, yeah, withdraw consent and this would compromise the whole um, material. So therefore it affects how we uh, formulate the consent, uh, uh, the informed consent. So we communicate clearly from the beginning of the project about the broad outline of the project. So this means it's an open research project. It's a uh, Community science, it's community science and it's driven by transformational research. And we communicate further how we collect the data and what will happen to the data. And uh, we make sure that all those who become involved or would like to become involved understand from the very beginning that they become involved in their role as co-researchers or co-creators of art and knowledge and even engage uh, as a type of uh, dementia activist in our research. So the concept form is very specific and very granular so that it is clear to the participants what happens to the different data and uh, which data is deposited in access controlled archives so that it can be deleted by curators upon request. However, for the openly published uh, material, we explain that it may be technically difficult, if not impossible to retract. So if you inform the participants of the data, of the date for publication and press the importance of withdrawing before the date, it's very, very important for them to make their decision on this information. So the group um, consent explicitly to open publishing twice, both in written consent and later as consent by editing. Excellent. Well, Thank you both for taking the time to talk to us. Um, do you have any final advice for researchers who want to share their research data? I would like to say something, and that's <coughs> the first thing is that uh, I was quite skeptical to open data when I first heard about it, uh, because I thought it was impossible with the uh, consent forms uh, that we usually do, uh, use. Uh, and the agreements that we normally use, they promise full anonymity. And we, we could, can't do this um, uh, uh, in this research, open research. So uh, also that the traditional consent letter state that the data should be used for this project only and uh, deleted after a certain time. So with this, uh, if you should continue using those standards, it wouldn't be possible. But then now, as you have heard, we have done it differently. And I think we need to also in the future to think differently about this. That's what we have done in the project and that's what we will continue doing. Uh, and hopefully others can learn from our experiences as well. And to sum up, planning is the clue. <laughs> One must uh, prepare for open access um, from the very beginning. And uh, part of the planning is to decide what can be open to all what needs curating and limited access at, and what cannot be published uh, at all. And finally, I would say that the trust that we managed to develop uh, during the research process, before and during the research process, is crucial to what we can do uh, with the data and how we can handle the data. So, but uh, we know that the, um, developing uh, a, a relational trust takes time, but we do also think that good research take, take time. Mm. I couldn't agree more. Thanks again for the interview. Not all data can be shared openly, but the work at the Artful Dementia Research Lab demonstrates how it is possible to archive and share the material that contains personal information by using a combination of informed consent and regulated access control at the repository. Mm -hmm.